So a lot of us have heard the buzzword of professional development, personal branding. So what is a personal brand? And why do you need one? Today here at our inaugural professional development lunch and learn, Amy Martin is gonna answer those questions for us. Amy is a brand builder with 20 years experience helping organizations and brands reach their target audience. She is the founder of the Blogger Collective, She and the CLE, which has helped drive purposeful conversations for women in Northeast Ohio. She is the marketing head of Jumpstart. Jumpstart unlocks the potential of the diverse and ambitious entrepreneurs we have in our area. As if that's not enough, <laughs> Amy runs her own consulting agency, HyperThink, which helps small businesses and leaders connect to the audiences through purposeful engagement. So please join me in welcoming Amy to Try C. Amy. Thank you, thank you. I hope you guys don't mind, but I cannot stand still. It's just not my personality. So I'm gonna walk, if that's okay with you guys. Um, so it's really, really great to be here. I've known Christy for a couple years now. We actually met at a networking um, and development group for um, the YWCA, and it was amazing. So I've always wanted to come here, so I'm, it's great to be here. One point about me is don't save your questions to the end. This is really interactive, and it's meant to be learning. Personal brands are exactly that. They're personal. So something you know may hit you, and you may want to ask a question about it, and don't wait, because we don't have a ton of time together. So let's make it actually work. Um, so as they said, I'm here to talk about personal branding, but I think what's really important is to understand why personal branding is important. Okay, so this is one of my favorite quotes. It's from Porter Gale, who's the author of Your Network is Your Net Worth, which is an amazing book that I highly recommend for people who don't feel like maybe they have an established network. And that's what your personal brand is really about. It's about allowing you to network when you can't be at events and you can't always be face to face with people that can help you move your career and your professional life forward. So this is a great quote that I believe your social capital or your ability to build a network of authentic personal and professional relationships, not your financial capital, is the most important asset in your portfolio. So in a prime example of this, a very good friend of mine, very high up um, at an organization, was suddenly let go. At 48 years old, very, very established and very senior. She was able to activate her network and with three days had four interviews and within a week of that had a job. That was all through her networking. So I'm not talking about any of you dramatically losing your job anytime soon, but your network is more than just pals to hang around with. It is to be used strategically and thoughtfully in the times that you need it. I use my network to climb within my own organization. So that's what we're really talking about here. That's the meaning behind building a brand, is you can't build a network if people don't know who you are, okay? So, and this is the other thing that I say, because I always say that networking and your personal brand has to be based on complete authenticity. If it's not, you're not believable, you're not real. We all know people who aren't genuine in life. Hopefully we know less and less of that as, as we get older. But if your brand and who you are and your reason for networking is not true and is not authentic, people will not help you. So this is kind of my own personal networking statement that really defines how I interact with people. And anybody I've met with or had lunch with or have networked with, they know this about me. And I presented this at a LinkedIn summit that make no mistake about it, I do not network for fun. I do other things for fun, right? I view networking as an important part of my job. I'm honest with myself and everyone I network with about why I'm meeting, and it is always for personal benefit. So when I first started saying that, you can imagine people's reactions, that it's a little aggressive, it's very one-sided, 
but know that I don't go into any networking situation thinking that they're only gonna help me. I know that they're coming with their own agenda too. But I don't put any blinders out there. I don't put any smoke and mirrors about, oh, I just wanna have coffee with you and, and just catch up. No, I wanna have coffee with you for a reason. I'm interested in something that I think you know about. There's a job within your organization that I wanna talk to you about. I have a friend who needs a mentor and I think you would be great. I don't do the soft call outs. And because my personal brand is strong enough, people usually know why I'm reaching out, okay? So does everybody understand what I'm talking about, about the reason for the personal brand? It really actually leads back to your networking capabilities, okay? So 85% of people research others online before meeting them for the first time. Anybody in this room doesn't do that? Raise your hand. Anybody just go in blind and meeting people? Wow, you're brave. I never do that. You do too? Interesting. I do not. Um, this, is, this raises every year, obviously. So what does that lead to You know, when you think about how you show up online? And we're going to talk about that. But you know, when I talk to organizations like you, I talk to a lot of groups that are out looking for jobs. But you, know, you work for a very strong academic institution. I know a lot of people that I talk to here have been here for many, many years. That's a sign that you have a really strong organization behind you. But career paths aren't linear. So you know, when, I used, when I came out of college, you, know, you kind of just moved up bump by bump. And now it's very common for people to jump into different departments, try things out differently within your own organization. If your brand isn't strong, I guarantee you're missing out on opportunities that could benefit you. <clears throat> so when I talk about a brand, I always start with how do you show up online? Because we all know you can't make it to every event, you can't make it to every lunch, you can't be in person as much as we used to be. Life is just too busy. So when you think about your brand, how does it translate online? So I'm just gonna throw that out there. If you Googled yourself, anybody in this room Google themselves more than once or twice a year? I would keep Googling. I have found things that I don't want at the top of my Google list. You know, it's like a Facebook post that got a ton of um, shares and things like that that kind of show up on the top of your, it wasn't bad, thankfully, but is that what I want to be known for? So, you know, be aware that people are, more than 85% of people are going to look at you online before they meet with you, before they consider you for an internal role, before they think of you as a mentor, or before they do you a favor. So how do you show up? So think about that as we talk through this presentation. So. Think about it this way, besides time, what's holding you back from establishing your personal brand? Can anybody throw that out there? Can anybody give me, so let me start with this. How many of you in here, be honest, think you have a strong personal brand? Okay, good. You're in marketing, you don't count, you better. Okay, good, too. All right, so that's not a lot. So then let me ask one brave soul, what do you think is holding you back besides time? Because everybody, I can say time too, right? We can all say time. Outside of time, what's holding you back? Anybody brave enough to throw it out? Yeah. Not knowing what you want to put out there? Yep, okay, good. That's what this presentation's about. <laughs> Hopefully you won't have that fear. Any, anything else before we move on? Anything different than that? You don't want to be boxed in. You're not going to like one of my slides. I get it. <laughs> so let's come back to that. <laughs> I get it. But I think both of yours kind of play off of each other. That if you don't have some structure around how you talk about yourself, it feels very um, uneasy and you feel very um, afraid of what you're saying and you don't know how to position yourself. But if you're too stereotyped or boxed in, it doesn't really represent you, right? So it's an interesting balance there and we can talk about that. Yes. I'm sorry, one more time. Oh yeah, you're a woman, you're gonna say that. You put others' needs in front of yours. Sorry guys, but women do this way more. So, and that's very true, right? It's true, it's something we naturally do. Men do it too, you guys are nice too. But I'm just saying, more women do it than men statistically. There are studies on it. Um, so I'm not used to having men in these presentations, so I love it. 
Usually when we say personal brand, it's all women. So I'm very excited. I think it's very interesting. You're all sitting on the left side of the room, but I love it. Um, so, but it's a great point, And we're going to talk about that at the end of the session. <clears throat> so defining a personal brand, I always go back to Chris Brogan, who's a kind of lead marketer or somebody I really admire. When he talks about personal brands, he's, if you really say, what is it? It's a strong personal brand is a mix of reputation, trust, attention, and execution. And I think that's perfect, and that's a lot, right? And so when people think about this, they think it's a lot of work, and it is. I'm not gonna lie to you, but if you do it strategically and smartly, bit by bit, it is work, I promise you, that will return you an ROI, right? It will give you back what you put in, I promise. So, defining a personal brand. This speaks to this table right here. So what do you think of when you think of your own personal brands? How do you really sit down, and it can be exceptionally overwhelming. Even for me as a marketer and a communications person, it's hard for me to sit down and think about everything that encompasses me as a person. We're complex individuals. So your goal is to simplify it in a way that is digestible for other people. You're never going to be as dynamic in a written statement as you are going to be in life, OK? That, that will never happen. We'll never make that happen. But that's OK. This is a substitute of when you're not there. So these are kind of the three buckets that I tell people to start with when you're really struggling with how to start to define your brand. One, what value do you bring to your company? So I will tell you, at my company, I'm an ideation person. People come to me when they need ideas. Outside of my skill set, that's my favorite thing. And I would say at Jumpstart, that's probably what people know me for the most. What expertise do you bring to your role? So I'm the head of marketing at Jumpstart. I know everything about consumer engagement. Right? So I know everything about nurturing and engagement campaigns. I'm a back-end data junkie on websites. I know how to track user experience. So like, I would say user engagement and user experience is the expertise that I bring to my role. I have 15 other people that work for me, but that's, that's the expertise that I bring specifically. What personal strengths will help your team reach its goals? So when you think about what value you either bring to your organization or to your team, what is that? Because that's really important too. I think for my team, I let my team be the smartest people in the room. I have a big marketing group. They're young. They're dynamic. They're way smarter than me. So when we walk into rooms, I make sure I kind of know my role and I let them do what they do best but I'm constantly trying to work with them to develop their brands, to develop their identity, to develop their voice. So what is it that you bring to your organization? So these three things are very, a very easy way to stop and kind of think about how you can describe yourself. Now notice this doesn't really dive into the, I like cats and I like to paint. By the way, I love cats. Um, but you know, and, and those types of things work its way naturally into my brands. It's just not something that I have to think about as much. I have to really think, and I think all of us at this age, especially as we're having younger workforces come in that are very dynamic, very socially engaged, very vocal, we have to really challenge ourselves to be able to talk about ourselves succinctly and smartly and get out what we do really well. It's not bragging. How many of you are afraid to, to sound braggadocious a little bit? Is braggadocious a word, or is that just Mary Poppins? OK, good. Yes, you had a question. So I'm Richard Bazil. I'm an assistant. Richard Bazil, I'm assistant dean of the Learning Commons at Metro Campus. Mm -hmm. and Defining personal brand seems to be tied very much to your organization. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's personal brand, but it's the company. Those, those questions up here seem to, you know, can you have your personal brand outside of that? You can. It's a great question. Okay, it's an absolute fantastic question. I don't know if you guys remember when Twitter and, and Facebook and everything first started coming out and people had two accounts. 
You guys remember that, or am I the only like old person in the room? But like, you know, people had their, their account that they put personal stuff on and not. That has gone away. And why has that gone away? Because it's not authentic. It's only one side of you. So I think you bring up a really good point, okay? But what we're gonna focus on a little bit today is, I can't help you sift through your personal stuff, right? So I'm not gonna sit there and talk about, oh, I would talk about dogs over cats, or you know, cats rage and higher on YouTube and have a higher SEO. That's all in your crazy little worlds, right? Your personal thing and, and what you feel comfortable sharing about relationships, about that kind of stuff that make you who you are. That's your stuff that you have to authentically bring to the table. What people struggle with when it comes to personal brands is talking about what you're good at in your profession. People can't do it. Now, not everybody in this room. I'm sure there's some of you that do it very well. But over 85% of women do not do this. And it goes back to the question I just asked. It feels like we're bragging. So I've had people tell me I come across exceptionally arrogant. I'm totally OK with that. I don't mind it. I don't think I'm arrogant. It depends on how you know me. You guys might have that sense for me up here. That's not something that's going to hurt my feelings. If you tell me that you've known me for five or 10 years, but you still don't really know what I do, that's going to bother me. That's going to bother me much more. Because how many opportunities did I miss out with you, with your organization, within your network? How much money did that cost me? It all goes back to money at the end of the day. And anybody who says not, you're not really thinking about it. Because the jobs that you get, the opportunities you get within your own organization, all translates to financial security. People who can talk about themselves with confidence can think about it, can step up and say, I'm capable of this, financially at the end of your career are way off, way better off than people who can't. It's a little uncomfortable for people to think about that way. It's not uncomfortable for me. I've had good teachers that way. But you've got to think about it. OK, so what makes up a personal brand? This comes back to you. Job, events, network, hobbies, digital. This is just some of them. The whole concept of this slide is it's a lot if it's authentic, if it's genuine to you. So defining your digital presence is what we're heavily focused on today, because this is the hardest part for people. So I always try to say, when you think about the mix of personal, professional, it's really the intersection of your passion, your personal beliefs, and your professional beliefs. You may want to put stuff out there about religion and faith. You may want to put things out there about politics. I would encourage you not to, depending on where you are as an organization. But if you need to do that to be authentic, people do that. You have to be super careful. This can cost you your job. This can cost you your job. <clears throat> I'm pretty vocal about where I stand on a lot of issues, but my company, Jumpstart, is very vocal about where we stand on issues, and I'm lucky enough that they align. I would tell you, understand where your company or Tri-C stands on this. Understand what is outside of the bounds, because that can cost you. So what can you bring to the table that shows your authenticity that doesn't put your profession at risk? It's a major thing, you have to think about that. That goes along with a lot of the fear of why people are afraid to go out, but you've gotta, you gotta just think about it. A lot of it is common sense about what aligns with your organizational objectives, goals, mission. So here's the bucket that you're gonna hate. So when I've gone around and did this, and I've, I worked with Accenture a lot, the biggest um, fear that people had was I just, I don't know what my strength is that I can tell people outside of like, I'm a chemist, I'm a lawyer. Because, you know, that's a title. That's not who you are. So Accenture did this great workshop with me and we came up with four personas. So I'm gonna go back to you, eating the soup. I wanted you to know I heard you. You can, <laughs> you are way more dynamic than these four boxes, I promise. But this is just a help this is just a little bit of a tool to give you a sense of a little bit of structure of how you can think about yourself. 
So as we look at these, think about which box or boxes you may relate to. Connector, expert, change agent, and influencer. A connector, someone who connects people to resources or other people. This person is often well-connected and informed about available resources. So when you think about a connector, you all know them. Christy is one of them to me. Who is somebody that is constantly introducing you to the right people? They are able to kind of make those lines connect when they meet someone. Oh, I met you at a party. You were talking to me about X, Y, and Z. I have a friend, Julie, who's in the same profession. You two should completely hook up. They send that email. They connect you. A connector is a powerful person to be. So, you know, when you think about having a little bit of reservation, calling yourself a connector, does that feel braggy? Does that feel a little bit out of your comfort zone? It's, a, it's an easy enough thing to think about. A lot of people fall into the connector category. Very low risk. Think about it that way, very low risk. The expert, someone who demonstrates proficiency in a subject matter or on multiple topics. This person will often share their expertise or others' expert knowledge. The woman on the right is Janie Juvan. Anybody besides Christy know Janie? She's a very, very well-known lawyer in Cleveland. We're lucky to have her. She's young. She was named one of the youngest kind of senior partners in a law firm. She grew her book of business from local Cleveland to now national, and she grew it by, I think, $8 million by predominantly being online. Lawyers tend to shy away from having an online brand. Janie does not, but Janie understands where she fits. She's an expert. She weighs in using her expertise. She doesn't use her opinion. So she weighs in on laws. She weighs in on companies going through major trials and things to watch out for. Very low risk, again, but very, very specific to what she knows. How many of you in here could see yourself being an expert in your field? I work with a lot of chemists, a lot of engineers. They're experts, right? A lot of lawyers. Again, low risk, influencer. This is someone who persuades others by contributing convincing views and information on specific topics. This person will often seek to unite people in support of an idea or a position. Highest risk, but can yield the biggest reward. So this is somebody that writes opinion-based material. This is somebody that's trying to change your mind. These people are often interviewed quite a bit on the news, often have a lot of, maybe a little bit bigger of a persona. Very high risk if you are not aligned with your organization. This is where you can lose your job if you're not careful. But an influencer does exactly that. They influence people. They get people to move. They get people to think. And lastly, a change agent. A change agent is a little different from an influencer because an influencer can, is usually talking about topics. A change agent is somebody who is directly focused on changing one thing, being a trailblazer or a leader. This is uh, Sonia Hole Perkins, who for me, Sonia, is, uh, is a definite change agent. She's in the venture capital world. I'm in the venture capital world. And she's fighting to have more women at the VC tables because women tend to give to more women. 91% of venture capital goes to white men. Sorry. So we get more women in the VC world. We get more of the VC money going to women and people of color. So she's a trailblazer. That's what she's focused on. That is her change agent mentality. So when you think about these four, is that a little bit more digestible? So which one of the four personas do you think you can start with? Can you start with imagining yourself as a connector? I'm somebody that connects people really easily. Can you think of yourself as an expert? I'm going to start weighing in on matters that I know fit within my bandwidth. I'm not guessing on anything. I'm staying right in my lane, but I'm being vocal about what I know. Do you want to be an influencer? Do you want to be a voice around something that you want to see change in academia? Or do you want to be a change agent? Are you solely focused on one dynamic issue and topic that you want to put your whole heart and soul in? Anybody have, I can see myself being in one of those or multiple? No one? Two? Okay. 
What's yours? Expert and change agent. Were you the who had their hand up? What's yours? I would say depends on what the job is. Okay. So I work in a position. I got my degree in a different position. And I also experienced it in a variety of different aspects. Because if I'm the person that's working in the office, I have to be able to get the job done. If I see a situation where I know people are well experienced in that, mm -hmm. and I spend time in it, either volunteering or working it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I definitely feel that different situations yield different types. Sure. And I think for people I think for people who are very comfortable with their personal brand, that's very true. I feel very similar. But when you're thinking about baby steps of where to start, looking at these four can give you a little bit of direction. You also have to think this this happens for a little bit of younger generations, so I'm in my <clears throat> 40s, so a little bit younger than that. When I'm going and looking at people, I'm not getting online, I'm not getting a good sense of what I should be looking at. This speaks a little bit about to what you're saying, right? This is opinion-based, maybe I'm trying to influence. But when when you look at your personal brand, is it scattered? Are you trying to be a jack of all trades? Because we are dynamic people. Right? I am more than just an influencer in marketing. I'm a mom. I'm a cat owner. I skydive. Um, there's a lot of things I do that can come out in my personal brands. But when you think about online and people that are Googling you and searching for you and material that you're putting out, because digital is a two-way. You don't just read and you don't just push out. If you want to take advantage of the full digital revolution, you do both. So if I'm looking you up, do I have a clear sense of who you are or what you want me to know about you? You want different people to know different things, but it, in this, personal brands are fluid. My personal brand six months ago is not exactly how it looks today because I have a different goal right now. I want to do something very different today that I did six months ago. So when I look at my social profiles, when I look at things that I'm publishing on LinkedIn, it's very focused on the goal that I want to accomplish, who I want you to see when you see me online today. Okay, so that's why we kind of start in little bits and pieces. Any questions about this? Yes. And you gotta go to a lot of events. It's gonna, so her question was, what if you don't wanna put a lot of information out there? Now you said something though, you don't wanna put personal information out there. What if you wanna put your professional information out there? Does that bother you? A little bit? That, I understand it. Listen, I understand it. Then you've gotta be visible at a lot more events. I personally can't do it right now because I'm running three companies and I can't do it. When I was a little bit younger, I was definitely out there at more events. So my digital presence and my personal brand online has now come up a lot higher and a bigger priority for me because I can't be every place that I wanna to be to take advantage of new business or different opportunities. So it's totally fine to say, I don't wanna be out there as much digitally. And I get, right, I get the, I don't care what you ate for lunch and you posted it on Instagram. That's not what this is about. Right, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about, I do that too, by the way, but um, that's not how I want you to know me. Christy knows my, she just told me when I walked in, I know everything about you because I follow you on social. I'm like, it's a backhanded compliment and I love it. Um, but when you think about it, it's okay to be a little bit more private online, but then know that if you really want your name and your brand out there, then you gotta step up your in-person meetings. Okay, so your digital brand is really meant to supplement all the face-to-face -face time you can't have because of work, because of kids, because of other outside um, things that are pulling away from your professional time. Does that answer your question? I'm gonna take that as a yes. Okay, so how do I convey my brand? The purpose of personal brands isn't to provide a social overview, Instagram your lunch, of every aspect of your life. It's to establish you as a clearly identifiable leader in your field, whatever that looks like. Whatever your field, whatever field you want it to be in. It doesn't have to be 
something you're doing exactly today. Some of you may be making soap on the side. There's, I actually have a very good friend who's very, very successful in marketing, and she makes soap on the side, and she kills it. And her personal brand is all about soap making. She doesn't need anybody else to know her about marketing. She wants to sell soap. And so when her personal brand is all about being an entrepreneur, she's a maker, she's in the soap and lifestyle business, and she does great. Because that's her goal right now. In five years, she may be out of the soap world. And she may be trying to find her way back into a different digital role. She's going to have to evolve her brand. What channels are important? How many of you are on every channel that is up there? And you, Take away Pinterest. I hate Pinterest. But let's just take away Pinterest because there's men in the room. OK? There's a few of you. I hate Pinterest myself, so I can, but hey, it's huge. It's huge, but I struggle with Pinterest. So the whole point of this slide is to let you know that if you're on all of these and you're not in marketing, you're probably not using them well. This is a lot of channels, a lot of channels. To manage your time and to manage your presence on these actually does take some strategy. And it does take some thinking. So if you're just on all of these for personal and you're just pushing stuff out, that's totally fine. But if you're using your dig digital channels for professional purposes and you're on all of these, I guarantee you're not getting an ROI based on how much time you're putting in. It's almost impossible. I get paid to do this so I can do it. But it's very different if you're not in marketing. So getting started, and when you think about your time online, I tell you to think, who do you want to target? What themes do you want to cover? What tone will you use? And that determines which channels you should be on. OK? And I believe this is on your worksheet, too, on the front side. So this is kind of where I start when I figure out how I want to define my digital presence. So I filled out Amy's digital brand guidelines. Now again, I'm in marketing, so this is full. All you have to have is one line across. That's it. This is a good place to start, the who. So you'll see I have a line going on both sides, professional and personal, because I am authentically my entire self, right? So the who. Anyone interested in marketing, branding, and social media, I'm trying to connect with. Bloggers and journalists, because I run Sheen Lee, a blogger collective. Entrepreneurs, because I work at Jumpstart. Women in leadership, obvious reasons. And friends, family, and other parents, because I'm a mom, still trying to figure it out. My themes match each of my subjects. And then my tone is pretty, it's pretty well-rounded. My tone for me is conversational and informative, appropriate humor, it's opinion, I guess, and inspirational. So there are many people that make snark work really well for them. There are many people who are super conservative with their communication. Janie Juvan, the lawyer, very conservative. There's no emojis in anything she puts out. There's no humor. It's straight about law. It works very, very well for her. But I'm very in tune with what works for me. There are some things I put out that are a little jokey. There are some things I put out that are pretty passionate. And I'm OK with it. It matches with my personality. So you have to understand what you're comfortable with. People struggle with tone, and you should, because tone can be taken different ways online. You know, there's, there's some big risks that can be taken with tone, especially right now in today's environment. And then the channels. So once I figured out who, and I figured out what, it was easy for me to think about the channels. Again, I'm in marketing, so I'm on a lot. You only need one. And bottom line is, you have to be on LinkedIn. You have to be, in this day and age. If you're not on LinkedIn, I would get on it. If you are on LinkedIn, I would talk about and really think about how you use it, OK? And we'll try to get to that. So anybody want to share an answer to one of the four questions? Anybody want to talk about who they want to reach or a theme that they want to talk about? If you don't want to, we'll move on. We only got 10 minutes. but. Any questions around filling this out? 
because this is really a tool for you guys to take back with you. And I can stay after, because I do get a lot of questions about this usually after. So online profiles. Remember, LinkedIn is the base. That's, that's the first one. But keep them consistent, but they don't have to be duplicative. Different channels speak to different types of people. On LinkedIn, I'm all business. On Instagram, I'm definitely a little bit more personal. I use Instagram a lot for she and the CLE. I use Instagram a lot to show the entrepreneurs I work with and the women that I women-owned businesses I support. It's a lot on Instagram for me. On Facebook, I talk a lot about losing my daughter this year to college, going off to college, and me being an empty nester and how much I'm going to struggle with that. I'm totally fine with that. With that being out there, that doesn't bother me. So, you know, people shouldn't have a problem going to different channels of yours if you're on multiple channels and understanding that you're the same person. That's being an authentic digital, that's having an authentic digital presence. So take inventory of your online. Are you truly you? Are people going to understand and connect with you on multiple channels? That's all SEO driven. That all rises you to the top of search when people are looking for you. And by the way, if you have private accounts, I can usually still see what you post. There's a lot of us out there that can still do that. So just keep that in mind, political, political. OK, so how do I find good content? This is a question I get all the time. I want to start pushing content out on LinkedIn or on Facebook or whatever channel works for you from that networking side. I have a lot of people. By the way, I'm not just talking about my kids on Facebook. I will post a picture today from here that I was here today. People on my Facebook page know, in my feed, know that I'm more than just a mom. And I don't make any apologies for that. I bring my whole brand to every channel. I emphasize different things on each brand. I'm definitely more of a mom on Facebook than I am on LinkedIn. But Facebook will know I was here today with you. OK? So the hardest part for a lot of people is I don't know how to push content out because I don't have that much to say. When people say this, I'm like, ah, you're smarter than you think. But we all need some help staying on top of things. Blogger aggregates are great. I use Feedly, uh, LinkedIn Pulse, the Apple News, whatever that comes through on your phone. I read that every morning for 10 minutes. I have an aggregate of all the, all the blogs and the newspapers and online channels that I follow, and I glance at the headlines. And I share some of that content that is relevant to my field. So just think about LinkedIn. If you shared one article every other day on LinkedIn, sometimes with a comment, sometimes not. A comment could be interesting read. That's not that controversial. But if you do that every other day, you would be amazed how much your visibility and awareness grows on LinkedIn. It's all about algorithms. You're not showing up in people's algorithms if you're not proactively pushing out content. You're not being seen. You're not being heard. It doesn't have to be overwhelming. You can simply share news. You should be commenting on people's posts as well. Again. It doesn't have to be anything that's going to get you fired. It could be, thanks for sharing. It all plays into the algorithm. So on the channels that you're on, are you staying relevant within the feed of the people that you want to see you? I want the people that follow me on LinkedIn to see me every dang day. I want speaking engagements. I want to know about job opportunities out there. I want to know what's happening in my field. I want to be called from media. I want all of that. I know that, and I go out. I push content out so I'm in the feeds. So how to engage with influencers. So when you think about this, and when I'm talking about influencers, I'm talking about the people in your feed. These are people that can influence your career, influence your life. You can influence theirs. When you think about pushing content out and interacting and engaging with people online, the law of reciprocity states that when someone provides us with something of value, we feel compelled to return the favor. Somebody likes your post. Somebody shares your post. Somebody comments. It's just like me walking right up to you and saying hello and you not saying anything back. It feels really bad, right? 
somebody comments and engages with you and they seem normal, engage back. Don't give negativity power. We all know that, common sense. I get a lot of negativity on some of the posts I push out. I talk about women in venture capital space. You can imagine what I get called. I don't give those people power. I don't engage with them. I engage with people that disagree with me respectfully all the time. I don't know how you can disagree with that more women should be in venture capital, but hey, it, there are. There are plenty who disagree with me. I engage in conversations that way. I don't engage in being called names that I don't say in front of my kids. But interact with people that interact with you. Don't leave somebody saying hello and not responding. So a couple quick tips on LinkedIn. Quality is more important than quantity. So I'm telling you to be kind of in that, in that algorithm. But you know, think about what you're putting out, because I can still see it. So if you like something on Facebook, if you like something on LinkedIn, I can see what you liked. So don't just scroll through and hit like and don't read things. There's clickbait out there. There's all of that. You don't want to be associated with things that don't truly interact with your brand. So it takes a little bit of time. Yes. I was at a workshop where they talked about LinkedIn and said that you should be friending people outside of your organization on LinkedIn and former employers, but not the people that you currently work with. What is your take on that? What, who told you that? Somebody from LinkedIn? Um, they weren't from LinkedIn. It was just a workshop on social media. And <laughs> well, <laughs> wait, was it at Tri-C? It was not at Tri-C. OK, then they're wrong. <laughs> 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 I don't want to get Christy in trouble back there, but listen, I look at LinkedIn. My boss sees what I put on LinkedIn, and we've had great conversations about things I've shared on LinkedIn. I tag him on stuff I put on LinkedIn. So I think it's all about understanding your parameters, understanding the boundaries. People that are a little bit worried about connecting with people they work with online are a little bit worried about what they're saying online. If you're not worried about what you're saying, anybody should be able to see it. So I see my work colleagues as people that can help me. I want to be considered for internal positions. There is a strategy behind it. If there's a spot that's being posted that is outside of my field, and I know I can kill it in that spot and I want it, you better believe I'm going to start posting about how much I know about it. That is just strategic. That's just a strategic way of getting ahead and saying, I can do this job. I'm going to put my resume into the pile, but then there's, you know, streaming through LinkedIn, and they see that I shared an article on it. Well, Amy maybe does know more about this than I thought she did. People that are fearful are fearful for a reason. Yep. Do you, um, do you accept every connection that comes through on LinkedIn? Nope. Okay, because I sometimes feel black-based by it. I do, too. Yeah, I, this is my personal, everybody should have a personal preference on it, should be what you're comfortable with. I accept anybody that's connected to somebody that is within kind of a close circle of mine. Anybody that has no frame of reference to what I do or is not connected to any of my connections and does not send me a personalized note, I will not accept it. Anybody who takes the time to send me a personalized note of why they want to connect, I will connect with them. But again, it has to be personal, like what, what you're comfortable with. So LinkedIn profile tips, we can talk about it. But again, it goes back to SEO, search engine optimization, everything that's in your profile, um, these terrible skill things that everybody gets sick of, all those things. This is all searchable. This all ups your search, right? So spend a little bit of time on your LinkedIn. I list every board that I'm on. Um, I, you know, every probably a couple of weeks, I glance at my LinkedIn profile, and I make sure it's still relevant. My summary is a little bit different than it is. Oh, this is Anthony. This is my friend Anthony. His LinkedIn profile is great. Um, but if you check mine out, I just rewrote my LinkedIn summary about a month ago. It's pretty long. There's words in there that I want, it, that I want in there for a reason, from an SEO perspective. Are you putting in there your volunteer work? 
the other things that you're doing outside of your job? Are you talking about extensively what you do? Because titles don't mean anything. Take some time with your LinkedIn profile. It actually goes a long way. Um, share content as it relates to your area. We talk about this. Take advantage of the blogging platform. Again, you don't blog if you don't know how to write very well. But if you have something to say, and, you ha and it's within your field, and it's in within your expertise, and you have somebody that can work with you as an editor or somebody like that, blogging on LinkedIn will get you very far. It's gotten me on the news at least seven times. Now, I'm a writer, right? That's what I do. But you can blog a paragraph on something only if you're comfortable, only if it's in line with your brand and your organizational objectives. But it's a really, really strong tool. Um, it's not for everybody. Yeah? When you say blogging, is that using the same reference as publishing an article? Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. That's a blog on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Yep. So when we think about making the commitment, I would tell yourself to think about all the things you do in a day that maybe you don't need to do. Or maybe that, going back to one of the first comments you made, that you do for others. Can you find 10 to 15 minutes a day to devote to your online brand? I will tell you, I find this in very weird ways. I find this in, on, when I'm in line at Starbucks. I find, that I find this time when my boss, who's always five minutes late to a meeting, I'm, I'm never late to his meeting, so I will spend those five minutes going through LinkedIn, liking something, sharing something. You don't have to sit down and be like, I'm going to do LinkedIn. We're all too busy for that. Use your time wisely. You know, when my kids were younger and I'm reading to them and they were falling asleep, I was like tweeting. I'm not saying it's a glamorous life, but we don't put ourselves and what can help us professionally move forward. We don't put that ahead of a lot of things in life. And I'm telling you, as younger workforces are coming in, as dynamics internally are changing, people can work from home, flex, digital, everything. You've got to stay valid online. You have to have a persona. You have to have a brand presence. Baby steps are big, whatever it is. Don't miss the opportunities that are out there because you won't spend five to seven minutes on you in a day. Take five minutes less to do your hair. Think I, it's a trade-off for me. Sometimes something's cooking in a pot and I'm on my phone. I don't drive, I don't do anything like that, but I do put time every day to my personal brand. Okay? So we are CEOs of our own companies, Me Inc. To be in business today, our most important job is to be head marketer for the brand called you. I always say this, nobody looks right at you. This is going to sound mean because it's not, you seem very nice. But nobody looks right at you and says, I want to give her more money and I want to give her a promotion. We all like to think people do that, but they don't. Or, you know what, there's this great opportunity that is perfect for her. We just naturally don't, do, we're, we're focused on other things going on in life. So put yourself in people's feeds. Put yourself on top of people's minds when you want something, when you need something, something that you deserve. You're worth the time, I promise. Any questions? I know we're down to the wire. And listen, this isn't for everyone. I get a lot of people who email me and are like, I'm sorry, but you are very arrogant. You think very highly of yourself, and I'm just never going to think of myself that way. No problem. I'm never going to think of you that way either. So it's all about going after what you want and what you need, personally and professionally. Any questions? Anybody terribly disagree? Yes. Should, okay, is there, I've heard that there's like specific times to push out information that's very viewable, like yeah. at 10.20. Yeah, um, that you can like Google it, it changes. Okay. So she asked when's good time to push out content, yep. And also, um, should you be using like social media managers, like Hootsuite or something? Should you be pushing out that much information on a daily basis to make yourself even more visible? It's all about the, the online presence you want. Mm -hmm. So I use Hootsuite. 
So I usually schedule out a couple posts a day um, just because if life gets busy and I know I'm not gonna have time, I will use tools out there. Again, I'm in marketing, so I know these tools really easily. I would tell you to start with baby steps. You know, if you're not somebody who posts a lot, I wouldn't go to a, a, a tool like that yet. I would just start getting your feet wet and doing it. If you're somebody who's very comfortable pushing information out there, there are tools that push it out for you at optimized times, right? And those optimized times change. Everything changes constantly in the online world. But, you know, it'll tell you the best time to post on Facebook, 6 a.m., 4.59, 8.15. That was it like two weeks ago. Instagram, super early, 6 a.m. after 6 p.m. at night. LinkedIn, super early, lunchtime hour. So, but those change. So you can Google it and it'll tell you. It's really, that's the best advice I have. But don't use that tool until you're comfortable. Get used to going in there and actually typing out your updates and going in and kind of looking at it, looking at your feed, seeing what's out there. Because when you start to use those tools, you stop engaging really, genuinely. You just start pushing and you don't start absorbing as well. And sometimes a lot of the benefit is in the absorbing. Any other questions? All right, it was great to be here, thank you.